I want to welcome everyone this afternoon uh, to our Lenten lecture series, The Last Word. I'm going to open with some prayer and then I will introduce our speaker. I'm going to uh, pray from the daily devotions from the good old Book of Common Prayer. So uh, let's take a moment of silence and recognize God's presence here with us around the world here on Zoom. This is a reading from Isaiah. Oh God, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are fixed on you. For in returning and rest we shall be saved and quietness and trust shall be our strength. Let us pray. Blessed Savior, at this hour you hung upon the cross, stretching out your loving arms. Grant that all the peoples of the earth may look to you and be saved for your mercy's sake. Amen. Well, again, I want to uh, welcome everyone. Um, I think one of the odd um, wonders to come out of this horrible pandemic is our newfound giftedness at technology and the fact that we can have people here in person, uh, people on Zoom, and speaking to someone who is in Amsterdam. I think that that's a lovely thing. We want to welcome today uh, the Reverend Canon Fo Tutu Van Firth. She is uh, an Episcopal priest, artist, author, uh, accomplished public speaker, and retreat facilitator. She was the founding executive director of the Desmond and Leah Tutu Legacy Foundation. Uh, she continues work for environmental justice, human rights, and equal access to opportunity for all people without regard to race, class, or gender. With her wife, Marceline, she has established and is executive director of the Tutu Teach Foundation to enhance access to opportunity for women and girls. Ms. Tutu Van Firth and her wife live in the Netherlands. They have four children and two amazing grandchildren. Thank you so much for joining us today to give us your last word. I'm grateful that you're here. I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much for inviting me to be with you. Um, and I am looking forward to our conversation. Um, so my last words, it's not a complete thought. So even though these are last words, they are a work in progress. Whatever it is that we believe that resurrection means or eternal life, we place them as core to our beliefs. So there is a way in which I have all of eternity to work out this thought. And so maybe these are the first last words. And maybe even if they are the last words, they're just first thoughts and you can think with me. I came to this thought with the voices of people I admire ringing in my ears. Justice Albie Sachs, for instance, formerly a justice on the South African Constitutional Court, which is South Africa's equivalent of the US Supreme Court, and a struggle, an anti-apartheid struggle stalwart. He so terrified the apartheid governments that they sent him a gift a parcel bomb. It blew off his arm, blinded him in one eye, and sent shrapnel into other parts of his body that decades later have not yet been removed. 
this Justice Sachs, who I so deeply admire, and Tuli Madonzela, the beautiful, brilliant, soft-spoken woman who helped to craft the new, universally admired South African constitution and was, for a decade, the public protector, responsible at the time for the single South African institution that consistently boasted levels of public trust in the 89th percentile, at a time when South Africans' faith in institutions was beginning to crumble. Both these icons said the words that lodged in my brain as words of comfort, and have returned as challenges to my faith. We are a nation of laws. We must be a nation of laws. It is only laws that guarantee our well being and our security. I heard these words from the mouths of people I admire. I also heard them from the mouths of the oiliest of politicians and the seediest of businessmen. We must be a nation of laws. Why must we be a nation of laws? Because it is the law that guarantees our democracy and orders our lives aright. It is the law that underpins our rights and confirms our responsibilities. We want to be a nation of laws because of the guarantees that laws offer. Laws promise us even handedness and fairness. They assure us that we can draw a hard line of morality and hew to it firmly. Our laws guarantee predictability. Given this set of circumstances, we can expect this set of outcomes or rulings. The laws we write pledge that we will be on the right side of history. After all, they are crafted by the best and the wisest among us. As Christians, we read the assertion that Jesus made to the crowds, I came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law, and were thereby assured that we must be on the right track. But in the course of my long-ish life, I have learned that as Oliver Twist says, to every law there has to be doom, doom, the exception, and then there is the exception to the exception. So that every human law ends up being effectively arbitrary. Maybe in most cases, less arbitrary than utter lawlessness, but not much. When we begin from law, we end in contortions. The law applies here this way, but not there in that way. It applies to this person with this sanction, but not to that person. Or it applies to that person with a greater sanction or with a lesser sanction. And then the law makes us into liars. We lie in order to continue to proclaim our even handedness and win the prized name of moral icon. And if we avoid outright lies, we at least torture the truth. We call refugees migrants so that we're not bound by the laws governing human rights that we claim to uphold. We label people fighting for their homelands either freedom fighters or terrorists, depending on whether we think it more prudent to arm them or to bomb them. Or we call them all pro protesters and then we ignore them. Small example, 
In recent weeks, we've been treated to the spectacle of government agencies from Western powers seizing the assets of Russian oligarchs. So are we to understand that it was legal for Russians to launder money one month ago, but it is not so now? Or are we to believe that these ill-gotten gains only came to light when Russia invaded Ukraine? And I doubt that I have to enumerate for you the multiple instances of differential applications of law when all other things being equal, race is the deciding factor in how the law is applied. When we begin with the law, we are quickly entangled. We get enmeshed in the sinfulness that drives the separation between you and me, between us and them, between people and planet, between God and humanity. So if we don't order our common life by laws, how can we order our life together to avoid chaos? The human laws we make are designed to make life orderly and predictable, but somehow they end up trapping us in disorder and unpredictability. Human laws are rules upon rules. We write rules to cover the omissions of the other rules we have written. What God offers us rather than rules is relationships. Righteousness, that biblical prime virtue, is literally right relationship with God. And right relationship with God is impossible without right relationship with neighbor. Right relationship with God and neighbor cannot be without right relationship with all creation. And it is love that creates and guarantees right relationship. And it is love that is the fulfillment of the law. The gospel reading last week was the parable of the prodigal. We can discuss whether it was the father or the son who was extravagant, lavish, prodigal in his spending. Now I was struck by the insight into how both sons got it wrong. Well, we know they both got something wrong. That's the point of the parable. What is interesting was that the thing they got wrong was what we continue to get wrong down through the ages. The youngest son, when he came to his senses, decided that he was no longer worthy to be called the son of his father. He thought that he should be treated as a servant instead. It is as though he believed that his sonship was materially determined. He had hurt his father. He had squandered the family wealth. He had sold any claim he ever had to his father's love. The father instead had run to meet him before the first word of apology was spoken. He had come home and he was welcomed as a beloved son. The older son felt that he deserved the crown of love for the work that he had done. He had done everything right. He had earned his father's love. But the father reminds him that love is beyond deserving. He was already loved perfectly. Nothing he could do would make his father love him one iota more. Nothing he could do would make his father love him one atom less. Both sons tried to deny their relationship. 
The youngest son would set aside the relationship of being a son to his father. The older son would shove away the relationship with his brother. The father draws both sons into the embrace of relationship. We get so caught up in the notions of even-handedness. We're very like the prodigal son and the self-righteous brother. We get so deeply invested in the things that we lose sight of the people. We're so invested in the rules that we lose sight of the relationships. We keep reaching for an idea of fairness that looks right on paper, but can be patently unfair in reality. There is a way in which we are fundamentalist in the worst sense of the word. We want to be handed the rule. We want everyone to abide by the rule, regardless of their present reality. We don't want to take the time to build relationship or to hear their story. That would make life and community too difficult. But that is indeed the challenge of mature faith that Christ lays down before us. We are not condemned to walk the way of the world with rules and regulations to guarantee our good behavior. We are instead to be inspired to walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. The rabbis say there is one rule. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The rest of the Bible, they say, is commentary. So my last word then to you is an invitation to meditate on this. What would my life look like if it was ordered solely by love? Lovely. Thank you. I uh, would like to open this up for questions now. I, but I'm going to start since, you know, I'm in charge and I can. I <laughs> actually um, preached this past weekend on that parable. And I used uh, one of the stories from the book that you wrote with your father, the book of forgiving. It was a story about a bishop who was during apartheid when he was being tortured and he looked at the people who were beating him and out of love and concern, he said, they are losing their humanity. We must do something about that. Can you talk about that? That um, idea of, um, I mean, that sort of took uh, praying for one's enemy and made it very, very real uh, in that uh, in that instance. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, a, a, a truly amazing person um, who, yeah. <laughs> if you ever meet him, um, he has the loudest laugh. Um, has, you know, just the, a way of turning a room into a place of deep infection with joy. <laughs> um, he, he says, you know, he was, he was being tortured. He was in pain. He was terrified. Um, and he said, you know, 
it was maybe the the fruit of his prayer that that came to the fore that he felt these people who are torturing him have lost are losing their humanity and we must help them to recover it and it is you know that declaration of love and of um yeah truly walking in Christ's footsteps um that the the um emphasis and the call to be in relationship and that the you know the only way that we truly get to heal um is in relationship lovely thank you gar do you have uh questions from the yeah Zoom? if anybody that's on the chat would like to ask a question you can just put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself as well we'll just try to keep it organized so we can see everybody questions here um, I just oh okay we do have one comment here live why don't you you're going to need to come forward so that she can hear a little bit and there you go yeah. hi. Um, hi good afternoon um, I read the book that your father and Dalai Lama uh, wrote on the joy and it was amazing and um, I, it's it's hard to um, I think sometimes also find joy when there's so much grief out there. Um, how do you keep that joy alive when when there's so much going on in the world with COVID and the wars? Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I I think um, kind of you know, just having experienced my, my father's death in December um, and, you know, having this sense of really um, missing him in a very deep, achy way. Um, what has helped me to hold on to joy or you know the places that joy has found and surprised me um, have been the places of gratitude um, that you know as much as I I grieve the loss I am so grateful for the life that he had and the friends that he made and the people who he brought into my life and his ways of um, thinking and of being. And, um, and I think for all of us in times of grief, um, finding that uh, spark of gratitude, uh, finding any spark of gratitude is a path back to joy for us. And I think also that, um, that being able to share, um, you know, that, that, that not only um, sharing our happiness, but sharing our grief becomes its own occasion of joy. Um, we, we half the sadness of grief, um, even as we honor and uh, live through it um, by, by sharing our experience with one another. Um, and for those of us who grieve, letting people into our grief um, is, is also 
um, or can also be a blessing that we offer to others, um, offering other people the opportunity to serve, offering other people the opportunity to um, offer healing, offering other people the opportunity to, um, to experience our vulnerability um, really is a gift. The ways that we are in relationship um, are ways of building joy in, in our communities. Um, sorry, I, I changed something on my screen. I'm trying to get it back. Uh, the, um, I think that's a lovely thought about um, inviting others into that kind of ministry of, of care. Sometimes we feel like we're a burden. Um, we don't want to burden people. No, I'm fine. But uh, allowing others that, that ministry to enter into your vulnerability, your pain, um, is really beautiful. Kelly, did you say you were? Oh, shoot. <laughs> You're sharing your screen, so maybe you just want to stop sharing. Yeah, OK. I'd like to just uh, Sorry. call one. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. we can hear you, Patsy. And then Jane um, has a question to you, I think. You just said one thing that is so powerful, one line. Gratitude is a path back to joy. Gratitude is a path to joy. That to me is really powerful. Thank you. Jan, you had a question. Kelly, did you say that you were recording this? Yes. I need to hear it several times again to soak it in. <laughs> it's been recorded. It, it doesn't all get there the first time. <laughs> it was excellent. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah. We, our congregation has been doing a couple of things. We have something called faith clubs. So we have a, about six groups that meet that are a combination of Muslim, Christian, and Jewish people having conversation and relationship that's actually been going for several years. And then recently we have <clears throat> just taken on uh, two Afghan families that were walking with them for 12 months to help them get settled. And obviously these are both very much eye-opening and learning experiences for a large number of people in our congregation in terms of seeing what is sometimes, you know, realities that are so far away. Um, I'm just curious if you have insights to share as, you know, we are probably not all very good at this. Um, <laughs> and just trying to figure it out. If you have insights and encouragement in building these relationships across very uh you know into very different places than most of us might have ever imagined being um i just am curious if you have insight i'm not sure if that's as clear a question as it could be but i just would like to hear from you um well both of those sound like um really beautiful ministries um and um really enriching for all the communities involved. Um, which I, I, I think that's just perfectly lovely. Um, I, I had been with um, my, my parents on the semester at sea on one tiny leg of the semester at sea, not long enough, but okay. Um, and on the particular voyage that, that we were on, the students had, um, had, had got bands um, from one of the, the things that we had talked about was, uh, was 
assume positive intent. And, um, and that was the, um, the mantra that they held as a, as a shipboard community was that, you know, if you, if you don't know what's happening, just assume positive intent. And I think that, um, that that's really helpful in um, relationships across culture, across religion, across, um, uh, across all of the dimensions of difference that, that, um, that, that we can have. Um, because, yeah, we will make mistakes, put a foot wrong, say the wrong thing, or say it in a way that doesn't land in the way it was was meant. Um, but um, that, you know, assuming positive intent on both sides, that, you know, we are here really wanting to support your movement into this country and your um your your settling in and you are here really wanting to be able to integrate into the communities of of this country and if if that is our starting point um it makes for um uh opens it opens opportunities for building relationship where things can easily get shut down um, very quickly um, it's you know it's really easy especially uh, you know working across cultures it's really easy to do the thing that is um, absolutely right, correct, and appropriate in your context that lands as an insult or a, a dismissal or something in a, you know in a, in, in a different context, and just yeah that that we assume positive intent and we assume that all of us are coming into this with the best will in the world, and we are willing to um, to unpack the hurts when they arise. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I have a question from someone on the chat, so I'm gonna read it to you. Um, it says, thank you for being with us today. I'm incredibly thankful for the way your family has lived your faith out loud. As a young person who comes from an interfaith family, it was your father's work, your work, and even the support and advocacy from your mother in ministry that have played a major role in my faith journey, and now with hopes to become an Episcopal priest myself. I'm curious if you can tell me what hope you have for young people in their living their faith out loud. Oh, wow. Um, I have to say, I mean, I'm so um, hugely impressed by uh, young people, um, by their willingness to, um, to challenge what we take as the givens of our faith, um, to really challenge us to live the love that we claim. Um, I am so hugely hopeful for the next chapter of how it is that we are church um, by the attention that, um, that young people are drawing to um, all kinds of issues of social and environmental justice, um, of things that it's been comfortable or convenient for us as older people to, I have gray hairs, um, as, as, as older people to ignore or to set aside um, and to say, you know, uh, but this is not the faith that you're proclaiming with your mouths. Um, the thing that you say with your mouths has to show up in the way that you live your lives. 
Um, and so I, I, I think it's not only in living their own faith out loud, but in demanding that we all live our faith out loud. That is my um, greatest hope for young people. I'd like to ask a question if I can. Um, thanks for being here today. And um, the question I have has to do with forgiveness, um, which seems to make all relationships possible um, and continuing. And I wonder what your thoughts would be on um, when there's been a wrong um, committed and the other party doesn't offer repentance or remorse. Um, how to approach um, forgiving fully and completely when there isn't the opportunity to communicate with that person um, in terms of, of their own feelings of remorse or regret for the act? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is that we... Um, forgiveness is... The thing that the uh, that the the victim gives to the perpetrator, um, but it's actually the thing that the victim gives to themselves. Um, as long as we are waiting on their repentance or their behavior, they're the ones who are sitting in the seat of power because they determine whether or not we get to be free of the resentment or the hurt or, or the what, you know, whatever it is. Um, and so, you know, ideally um, they, they come to us with words of remorse um, and they engage in a process of, of seeking forgiveness, um, but our forgiveness doesn't depend on them at all in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Our forgiveness is our choice to make, and it's our choice to be able to say, um, I am no longer going to define you by that horrible thing that you did. Um, it doesn't mean that we're going to be best buddies, um, even if there is remorse or repentance. It does mean that I also no longer reserve the right to retaliate for what you did. Um, and I will no longer wish you ill. Um, and maybe I can even get to the point where I can wish you well, maybe not, but even to just, okay, I, I am at a place of neutrality for my own health and well-being. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other thoughts or questions? Not in the I, chat. Let's clear. Oh, Claire has one. Go ahead. Claire. Yeah. This is kind of like off, off book, but what is one question that you always want to be asked that is never asked? And, and why? Wow. Well, that's a hard one. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, um, I think I, I find that um, most of the most, yeah, in, in groups of people, um, the questions are usually so good <laughs> that, that anything that, that, that I would want to get asked, um, yeah, maybe, you know, 
what where where do I wrestle with with my faith? Which part of my faith is my wrestling place? Um, and actually, the last word um, today was really kind of where where I am wrestling, um, you know, with. Um, how do you mature in faith, number one? And number two, I mean, I, I, I've been um, finding more and more in, in my, my prayer over this Lenten period and in, the, in my Bible study over this Lenten period, um, and maybe in this, this place and time is um, how truly radical and revolutionary Jesus was and how um, how profoundly he was walking in the opposite direction from the um, from the times um, and um, we were we we were uh, in our Bible study today. We were reading the the gospel reading for for the coming Sunday. Um, and, and it was you know one of the one of the people in the Bible study just marked how. Um, Jesus manages to um, defend, uh, it's the uh, um, John, the, the anointing in John's gospel. So it's Mary, not random woman from the street. Um, and um, Jesus says to Judas, um, leave her alone. Um, she is, you know, preparing for my burial. And um, he manages to protect Mary without dissing Judas. Um, and it's, you know, I mean, just kind of looking at our behavior in this time um you know that that you know, how how could we um stand up for ukraine without um demonizing russia and russians and you know and and that um um, disrespecting um, in, you know, in that way that kind of makes it so difficult for us to then, you know, how do you come to a negotiating table with a person who you just said is a monster? Um, it, it, it's... <sighs> yeah, it's just... I don't know whether that's kind of living our faith out loud, but it is um, we want our faith to be less demanding than it actually is. And, and that um, so that's where I'm wrestling is with this faith that is so incredibly demanding and that is, you know, constantly calling us to account for how we are living the lives we have been given in the world in which we live. And how is it that we really can be um, witnesses to the faith? 
um, and not in that kind of insipid, um, we know how to go through the motions, but in that actual, this means something to me. And, and so it means something about how I treat the person who is across from me or next to me. Yeah, so I don't think that was an answer to your question. <laughs> I, I loved it because what I heard was like, how do we hold things in tension um, and doing so with great love? So you did answer it, I think. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we have time, I think, for one last question, if anyone has anything. This, uh, I think that Dr. Jan Werner was right. I'm very glad that we are recording this. There's a lot of loveliness to revisit and uh, this was just so rich. Thank you, thank you very, very much uh, for being here with us today, for your beautiful words of wisdom. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you to all. Thank you for clapping. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you and God bless you all. God bless. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.